Welcome to Literary Dialogues, where poets and writers read from their own works in support of peace, justice, and a healthy planet. Today, my guest is an award-winning independent woman filmmaker, Lourdes Portillo. Her many films explored Latinx themes worldwide. Bienvenido, Lourdes Portillo, to La Raza Chronicles. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. We're so happy to have you. Lourdes, your films are always so varied, but follow Latino X themes internationally. I worked on your first two films, Después del Terremoto, After the Earthquake in 1979, a fiction film about Central American immigrants and exiles in San Francisco's Mission District, and The Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in 1985, about the Mothers of the Disappeared Movement in Argentina under the military dictatorship, demanding to know the fate of the 30,000 disappeared people. Today, I'd like to explore your film history and how you find the format for your films following the old saying that form follows content. So let's begin with what was our beginning, which was Después del Terremoto after the earthquake in 1979. That was very easy to decide the format because we decided that format before we even began writing the script. We knew it was going to be a fiction film. Yes, we did. I know. I remember that. And because I think we decided is, I don't know if you remember, we had a conversation and I said, if we were going to make a documentary, we have to go to Nicaragua. Do you want to go to Nicaragua? And there was a war going on, of course. And you said no, and I said no, and we didn't go. So that's how we decided it would be a fiction film, right? And yes. also, you had had a lot of experience in theater, and I hadn't. So, you know, it was perfect. Well, yes. And also, I remember we had a conversation of what are the points we wanted to make. And we came up with a list of 14, and then we based our film on those 14 points. Wow, Nina, you remember that? Yes, I do. I love it, tell me. Well, we made the list, what the 14 points were going to be, and then we started conceiving of scenes around the 14 points. And we came up with a 28 page script and sent it out for grants and we got one and we started making that film. That's right, huh? That's of course, fantastic. we leave out the fact that I fell asleep on the BART train and left the grant behind as I ran out at my stop. And luckily, one of the employees who cleaned up the BART train had found it and saved it. There it was in the lost and found. So you didn't murder me as you were planning to do and we were able to send it in and we got the grant. <laughs> yes. And we made the movie, Happy yes. Ending. I mean, don't you think that that was lucky of us? I mean, we had never done that. It and was we, luck all the way. Right? Yes, and Everything. there weren't many women filmmakers around. No, 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 there weren't. That's true, especially in San Francisco. Yes. Right? I don't everywhere. know, if especially in San Francisco, I'd say even in the world, there were. No, you're people. right. You're right. You're right, Nina. In the world, it's true. So, so then it's... let's go on to the next film, which would bring you to 1985, Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. Mm -hmm. How did you come to that format, which was a documentary? I, I wanted to make documentaries from the get go. But I hadn't the experience, you know? But this time I was at the Art Institute and there were a lot of other people there and they had had some experience and I had taken a course in NABIT, which is the, uh, the TV technical people's uh, union. And they gave uh, third world, that's what they used to call us, third world people, uh, some free training. 
And I remember they trained me as a camera assistant, imagine. I mean, with my memory and my technical skills, <laughs> you know, it was difficult, but it, it was wonderful because, uh, you know, I did work on some uh, documentaries. So I had that, that experience of what it was like to be in a crew of documentarians and also to understand what a documentary was. I love the notion of dealing with reality and having a great respect for facts and for truth. And then that way you could tell a great story because the story was being told kind of by itself in a sense, it was happening. I don't know if that's clear, but you know, um, so that attracted me to a uh, documentary a lot, even though I was at the Art Institute where you do all kinds of other things other than documentary, you could do documentary, but that wasn't the specialty of the San Francisco Art Institute. And there I found a friend, Susana Munoz, when I was working already you know, with the music, because I loved tango and I was listening to Gardel in a flatbed. And I remember Susana coming by and saying, oh my God, that's from my country. And I said, oh, what's your country? She said, Argentina. And she told me about the mothers of Plaza de Mayo. She told me that story, what was happening in Argentina. Maybe you should fill today's listeners in because that was so long ago with who they were, who were the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo? Okay, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo were the mothers of 30,000 disappeared people during the, the military dictatorship of the 70s and 80s in Argentina. And uh, they had disappeared and no one was listening to the mothers and they would go to the main plaza in Buenos Aires and protest every week and no one was paying attention, no one. So an occasional um, uh, reporter would come from, you know, some place else. I think, I believe that one of our, our uh, some of our footage came from, uh, from Denmark. You know, they were European, uh, reporters reporting on what was happening to, you know, to the mothers and in their search for their children. And uh, casually, we got that footage and we used it in at the beginning of the film. Uh, then it, it was about their struggle and it wasn't being told in, in the greater world. It was known on you know, hear this newspaper in Holland or this little newspaper in Australia or something, but it wasn't like a big thing, you know? And it wasn't uh, until the story of the mothers really got out there and got spread, you know? Everybody started talking about it and seeing them, you know, what was happening that the movement became very large and uh, very demanding. And ultimately, you know, they found out what happened to their children. So there you were at the Art Institute listening to tangos on the, laying out on a flatbed of a truck. And how did it go? No, from no, that? no, no. The, the flatbed is, that's the editing table. That's what? <laughs> oh, that was the editing table. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's good, though. That's good. That's good. Okay. So how did you go from being in the Art Institute, working on your homework, I assume, listening to tangos, to getting a crew together and going to Argentina and making the documentary? Well, remember that I was like being trained by NABIT. So I had some friends at KQED and I had some friends here and I had friends there that worked in independent filmmaking. You know, there was Cine Manifest, which was a group of Marxist filmmakers in San Francisco who made some films, you know, and they were very protective and kind to me. And I was very grateful for that. So I knew that it was possible to do that, to do those documentaries. And then, you know, I figured, you know, we could, uh, 
we could get a crew and we could try to get money. And I had already gotten some money, you know, for the film that uh, we did through the AFI, you know. So American I thought- American Film Institute. Yeah, the American Film Institute. So I thought, well, I, I think I can try it again. I'll give it a swing, you know? And lo and behold, this, uh, this man called George Soros, you know, gave us $50,000 to start doing Las Madres. How wonderful. Right? It wasn't, I mean, you, we didn't have a lot of money when we made films. We had very little money, but a lot of desire, you know, to tell a story. And basically to tell the stories of what we considered to be things that were happening that were unjust. And you your, your crew came from the local San Francisco TV stations through that union connection? Yes, exactly. And yeah. so you arrived in Argentina. We arrived in Argentina. In the middle of a military dictatorship. In the, not at the tail tail end of the dictatorship. You know, uh, I didn't want to go during the full-blown dictatorship because people were disappearing, you know, and I had three children. So I thought that wasn't a good idea. So we waited a little while until almost the end of the dictatorship when, you know, there was a change in government and Alfonsin came into power and the military dictatorship was vanished and then tried and punished. Not as much as we wish they had been punished, but you know, somehow there was some justice. And how did you begin? The filmmaking, we began by going to the house of the mothers of Plaza de Mayo. Uh, the Dutch um, minister or the Dutch Somebody in the in the uh, high up in the in the Dutch government gave money to the mothers to buy a house in Buenos Aires, and that was their center. From that center, they would receive food and give it to the orphans, you know, of the disappeared. They would uh, give them medical care, whatever they could. They were helping, trying to help you know, the people that suffered from the dictatorship. And uh, we started doing interviews there. And then did you already have the footage that you had referred to earlier that you had found from Denmark? No, 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 no. That, that happened in the editing uh, phase. That was later when you- Yeah, that was later. Through. Once we, you know, I mean, we did a lot of research. We did a, a, about the dis different disappeared, you know, from different families. And we tried to figure out, out who were the best people to um, interview. And if they had pictures and, you know, if they were eloquent. I mean, obviously the mothers, they were like absolutely super eloquent, you know, and super... Uh, given to that task, you know, and so we we had wonderful relationships with them, and they continued because we didn't only go one time to shoot; we went several times. And then you returned and started editing. We returned, and then we tried to start editing, and then uh, we saw what we had and what we didn't have. And then there was another time that we didn't go to Argentina, but we sent the cameraman to go and shoot there, which he did. And then finally the whole picture came together. And you decided how you would tell your story. We decided how we were going to tell the story when we were doing the interviews, because the interviews were they were constantly feeding us. There, it was like a newspaper, you know? So we, we were changing the story or, you know, substituting one person for the other, or we needed this other thing. We were constantly like working at making it. It took a lot of a big effort. As you were filming, you were developing 
the storyline. Exactly. But this, the storyline was almost a given, you know, the mother search for their children and what was that task of searching for your children? You know, what did it mean? What did they do? Where did they go? All these things. So that brings us to the next film, which was the one that I've never seen to this day, The Devil Never Sleeps. <gasps> Sarah didn't send you the thing. No. Oh my God. Okay. All right. Uh, but from what I've heard, it sounds like a very personal family detective story. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it could be like that. That's, the, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a detective story, you know? And I'm, but it was be- true, it was a documentary. It was a documentary, totally. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, um, oh, I'm so sorry you didn't see it, Nina, because you can't talk about that. Well, I want to hear about, I want to hear the backstory so that when I do see it, I will be very enlightened. So that was in 1992. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when that started. And it How was- did it start? It started, I was in New York, and I remember my mother called me and she said to me, you know, your uncle died. They found him in the, um, in this uh, sporting complex in Chihuahua sports are are very big. And he was found dead in the running and you know, where people run. The track. The track, the running track. And he was found dead and there was a gun next to him. And, uh, you know, we don't know what happened. We don't know if it was, if he killed himself or someone killed him. And then all the family was gossiping and talking about it. And everybody had a different theory. And, uh, but, at the same time that it was so tragic, it was it was funny. Funny? Yeah. Why? Because of the gossip and, and the invention of stories. And, um, you know, the, the people kind of assuming this happened or that happened. There's a, a certain type of humor, dark humor in Mexico around all that sometimes. And it was happening in my family. Was this an uncle that you knew? Yes, very well. Yeah, yeah, that I knew well and I loved and, you know, so it's about looking back at his life, you know, the choices he made, you know, the tragedies that happened to him and and also the um, you know his relationship with the wives because he had two wives, so he, it's a lot about gossip, and it's also about um, memory because I go back to Chihuahua where I hadn't been in many many years and. You know, I see my uncle and my aunt and I go to the theater where I first saw a movie, you know, Cine Azteca. And um, I kind of inserted myself into the story. You you became a character in the story? I became a character in the story midway in the film because I couldn't get the uh, widow to be a part of it. Oh, so and it was, it was, were you her, did you feel you were her stand in? Not at all. I felt like I had to save my film. And how did you do it by being in it? By just putting myself in it in one scene when I'm on the phone. You know, I inserted my, myself into the film by having me film being in on the telephone. Uh-huh. And then from then on, you know, it's I also become a character in the film. It's kind of hard to explain. 
Do you become a narrator? I am the narrator. You are the narrator throughout the film. Yes. Even though yes. you don't appear until the middle of the film. Exactly, exactly. And so this was a decision you had to make in the filmmaking process. Exactly. While you were filming the film. Exactly, yeah. Well, I was on the run. <laughs> <laughs> Why on the run? Because you know, you're always on the run when you're filming, you know? You right. Just, that's what it is. So, uh, yeah, and it became funny, you know? It became funny and tragic. It was all those things. And how do you feel about that film? Oh, I love it because I work very closely with the cameraman and, uh, you know, we decided that we were going to take a certain kind of um, approach, you what know. Was that? What approach and was a that? Filmic, a filmic approach, a very, you know, intimate and kind of, it was kind of a self-referential kind of thing that became funny. Would you consider I, that a documentary film? It was a documentary. But did you ever resolve the mystery? No. So the crime remained unresolved? Exactly. Where it is to this day? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not resolved, as most things are, you know? I like that about documentary. I like the idea of to having to stick to certain things, you know, to truth and to, you know, uh, factual things. It, it's a great little cage to work in. So that brings us to 1993 when you made Columbus on trial. Now mm -hmm. that is another film that I haven't seen. And that involved Culture Clash, the comedy troupe. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So would you call that a documentary too? No, no, that's not a documentary. That was more of a performance documentary. So you captured their performance? I captured their performance, but it really was not, it was not a documentary. And it was more of a, just a, a yeah, it was like a performance. A performance of Culture Clash, the Latino comedy troupe, putting Christopher Columbus on trial? Yes, yes. And they had done a little skit in the mission about Columbus because it was Columbus's 500 and something birthday, you know, the, of the discovery of America. So this was their notion of what Columbus, you know, was going through. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. And that film was shown at the Whitney Biennial. So then we come to 1999, a whole movie for Selena, about right. the pop music star Selena. Right, right. From Texas. Right, yes, yes. And that was a real... Um, it was a short documentary that I decided to make because I didn't know. I hadn't, I didn't know who Selena was. When I walked in the living room with my mother and father watching, you know, Selena sing, and my mother and my father said, she's the hottest star. You know, she didn't, they didn't say hottest. I mean, she's the most popular star right now in Mexican television. And I said, I've never heard of her. Who is she? And they told me all about Selena. And she had just been killed. And I thought, what a tragedy. Finally, we have a star, right? And they kill her. So you discovered her as she was already dead. Yeah, I discovered her when she was dead. And what made you decide to do a film about her? I thought it was important to make a film about someone that was such a big star and such a, uh, an influence on young women, incredible influence on, on preteens and teens. Yes, you know? I remember so, my granddaughters being very, very <laughs> taken by her. And taken with her, yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's, and that's what, why I did it. And I just kind of, 
you know, went to a corpus and talked to the father, tried to talk to the mother. Of course, she didn't want to talk. And that was fine because she was in too much pain. And, um, and the sister and, uh, and visited her grave and talked to, you know, girls that wanted to be like Selena. And that was so important because at the end of the day, that, that was a very significant idol that came, uh, you know, in the way of, you know, Latin girls and very, very important. The ironic thing about Selena's death was that she was murdered by the president of her fan club. Yeah. Did you get to talk to her? No, she was in jail and we couldn't talk to her. But we talked to the father, you know, and uh, he gave us an interview. And yeah, no, no, it was a very, very tragic moment in, in our, you know, culture in this country for all the girls. And I mean, she's popular to this day. Yes, she's popular to this day. Yeah, yeah. And she was very wonderful, a wonderful singer, a great singer and dancer, but also very innocent. You know, she was kind of innocent. So then we come to 2001, Senorita Extraviada, mm -hmm. the missing women of Juarez in right. 2001 where Juarez was the scene of busy factories where people were working night and day and women were disappearing. And what brought you to that? Well, I think I, I you know, I've always read the Mexican newspapers because I always feel like I wanna know what's happening in Mexico. And I read a little article that said uh, 50 women have gone missing and no one knows what happened to them. And I said, come on, how can that be? That's Mexico, everybody knows what's happening. And I just didn't understand why they were presenting it in that way, that uh, girls were disappearing and no one knew. They knew. And uh, then I, launched this idea of going to film and uh, doing a lot of investigation. This has been like, I think the hardest film I've ever made. It was Is this very- like investigative journalism? Really investigative journalism and also very dangerous, you know? And um, we got threatened and, um, you know, they told me they knew where I lived and you know, all, all kinds of terrible things uh, and left me jarred, but I felt that it was my duty because I've always, I don't know, in all my films, I've always had the feeling that I wanted to do something for my people. That's always been kind of a driving force for me. I needed to get to the bottom of the girls of what is, you know, and I think, I think we did. Uh, How did you begin organizing that film? Well, that film, you have to understand that 50 women missing in Ciudad Juarez, and the newspaper says, nobody knows anything, baloney. There were, there were organizations, there were mothers, there were girls, you know, everyone was organizing to try to do something about these murders, you see. And I wanted to talk about that that it isn't 50 women missing and no one knows, everybody knows. So that's, that was my purpose. Then I decided that, that the women that have been working on it, the scholars that have been working on it, the radio stations, the photographers that were working on it, they all became my allies. And I went ahead and made the film. That's how it got made. And what did you conclude? I concluded, I. I don't have any proof of anything, but I know that it is, it was like a whole mafia of men that uh, use girls in parties and then they kill them or they do it for sport or they do it just for pleasure, whatever. 
but the worth of a girl is uh, close to nothing. In this story, this story that a girl is worth next to nothing is what I wanted everybody to know. And not only there, but everywhere, you know, a girl is worth less than nothing. You know, now things are changing somewhat in that, thank God, you know. Thank goodness, yes. Yes, thank God. And, uh, you know, I have a granddaughter and I can't be close to her and hold her hand hard enough to keep her close to me and protect her. But that's how people feel about their girls, that this has been going on for a long, 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 long time. Not 50 years, not 60, not 300 years. And that was the intention of this film, to bring that up and to show it to everybody. And, but show it in a way that it wasn't going to be gory, that isn't going to be like completely devastating, that you don't listen. It was going to be a film that could make you think and act. And I think that film was really successful that way. And did it reach a broad audience, do you feel? Oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Very broad audience. That was your last film? That wasn't really my last film. That was my last documentary. And then I did um, a series of oral histories with Latin American directors for the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. And the book was published with that, with a, a, P, a P, what is it called? Pacific Standard Time, LALA exhibit in 2017, which was, it, it was a project that lasted four years. And, um, you know, these oral histories. And then after that, I made a short little documentary about being old and sick. Is that the animated film? Abu's Dream. That's me. That's what my grandchildren call me, Abu. Yeah, for Abuelita. For Abuelita. Mm -hmm. That's the animated film. That is so beautiful. That is a very short, it's probably two minutes. Yes, maximum. But it's exquisite. Oh, Nina, you're so sweet. It's ex it's about a healing circle, and it's a very healing experience to watch it. It's very beautiful. Is that the direction of your new work? Well, th that work took four years to make. It was only two minutes because it was animated, and uh, my nephew animated it, and I thought of you when my nephew started animating, that I would say, Nina, no, no, we can't have our, our kids work with us. And you'd say, yes, 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 we need to have our kids work with us. And then I, of course, now agree with you. Yeah, that turned out so beautifully. So these, you're working now in a format that are more appropriate to your age and health. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your latest? My latest thing is doing a very long and intimate interview uh, with uh, my friend uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña. The comic. He's not a comic. He's a uh, performance artist. Performance artist. But basically, he's funny. <laughs> or maybe that's how I see him. Well, that's fine. I think you, you know, he can be very funny and very sharp and very, he can be a lot of things. And why have you chosen him? Well, no, he kind of chose me. And oh, so, you know, I said, okay, let's do it. We'll do it. Are you going to do it through Zoom or are you going to get a crew and no, it's going to be a crew. It's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be kind of a, a, a film. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure everybody is looking forward to seeing your latest work. You well. are a very popular filmmaker. So Lourdes Portillo, thank you so much for sharing the inside story of your filmmaking career. We look forward to seeing the next piece. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you. It's Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for doing this. This is a, a, a real nice thing to do because it's been so long since we have shared a conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Likewise.